I'm getting the uh, signal from our guide through guide to Zoom, Laura, who is amazing at corralling all of us. Laura, tell me if this isn't working. Here I am. Um, I'm Franny Eberhardt. I'm a president of the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. We were founded in 1982 uh, and are dedicated to the architectural legacy, livability, and sense of place of our neighborhoods. And we pursue that mission through education programs, the one tonight, uh, as well as programs in the schools for children, doing them remotely now, um, advocacy, uh, legislation in partnership with our elected officials, uh, and litigation when we must. Um, we're delighted to have as our co-host tonight, uh, Save Harlem Now, and its president, Valerie Bradley. Valerie, floor is yours. Thank you, Franny. Um, Save Harlem Now is an uh, advocacy organization that's uh, dedicated to protecting, preserving, and uh, celebrating Harlem's irreplaceable built heritage. We are also concerned about preserving contextual buildings, landscapes, and other elements that contribute to define Harlem's sense of place and special character. We are happy to be collaborating with the Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts to celebrate a few of the Black and Latina women who contributed to the history and culture of Harlem. We also thank Lee Hallensby for compiling this wonderful walk, which celebrates extraordinary women. It's important that we do this because as we speak every day, a little bit of Harlem disappears. And when we commemorate and celebrate those who made Harlem what it is, it helps it live on. Thank you, Lee. Great, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before I introduce Lee and turn the whole thing over to her. Um, let, me just, Lee, let me just do my little housekeeping. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the session. I think you all know that. And to put your questions in, please use the chat function. Uh, and Laura will collect them all and then uh, lead us through the Q&A when, uh, when the tour is, is finished. So uh, that, uh, remember that system. And if you have uncertainty about the chat, just uh, email Laura, she'll, she'll help you out. I'm uh, delighted to introduce Lee Hallenby, who uh, was professionally a librarian. Uh, she is, has been personally a feminist all her life um, and an uh, avid historian. In her retirement became a licensed uh, New York City guide. Uh, her uh, itineraries are somewhat unusual. Uh, the one that I went on was uh, a itinerary in West Harlem of murals of Audubon birds painted on facades and shop fronts on the street fronts. It was, it was a remarkable collection of, of images, very unexpected. And aren't we lucky that on this a uh, cold, drippy night, we can all sit here with, under the of our laptops uh, and, and may take a, a much longer walk through Harlem than we would ever be able to do, really. Um, so virtually, here we go. Um, Lee, it's all yours. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Franny and Valerie. And I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully everyone can see my screen now. So um, thank you so much for coming with me on this feminist walk through Harlem to celebrate remarkable women. And thank you so much to the Friends of the Upper East Side and Save Harlem Now for sponsoring me tonight. I'm very honored to be speaking. And thank you so much to Franny Eberhardt and Laura Sachin and Valerie Bradley and Angel Ion for being wonderful people to uh, work with on planning this event and for some of your excellent suggestions. So um, my presentation takes about 50 minutes, so I should be ending right about 7 p.m. And um, I am 
happy then to participate in comments and questions. So I was inspired to develop this walk to celebrate women because 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution that gave women the right to vote. I do want to acknowledge that women officially gaining suffrage in 1920 did not mean that black women had the right to vote then. Along with black men, they faced massive racial, racial discrimination and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was a landmark piece of federal legislation that finally prohibited racial discrimination in voting. But of course, the struggle for the right to vote is an ongoing story. Also, I want to note that this current time period is the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. This great outpouring of art and culture among African Americans can be dated from 1918 to the mid 1930s. So one of my favorite things about Harlem's neighborhoods is that it's part of the culture of both African American Harlem and Spanish Harlem to honor notable people via murals and mosaics, statues, names of streets and buildings, plus plaques on the sidewalk. A majority of those honored are men, but we will be stopping at many of the places where the honorees are women. So an advantage of doing this as a virtual tour is that we can visit both central Harlem on the west side of Manhattan and East Harlem, which is also known as Spanish Harlem or El Barrio. Actually walking from 141st, West 141st Street, where this vibrant mural on the screen is located to East 100th Street, where we're gonna end, including all of the stops we make along the way would probably take about four hours. So um, since Franny gave me such a kind introduction, I mainly on this page, I'm gonna mention that I have created two handouts related to this tour. One is a list of stops and the other is a reading and watching list. And these uh, handouts both came about because of requests from other groups for which I've given the tour. So um, they're my own documents and aren't connected to tonight's two sponsoring organizations. But uh, Laura Sachin is gonna be kind enough uh, to put the titles of the documents in the chat along with my contact information. And she's also gonna make it possible for attendees tonight to actually download the documents from the chat if they are interested. And um, please uh, feel free to contact me anytime if you think of a question later that you didn't think of tonight. Um, my email and my cell number are available. So our first stop is the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. It's one of Harlem's most important organizations. And since it's part of the New York Public Library, it's often also known as the Schomburg Library. So the main red building there dates from 1980 and underwent a major res renovation that was completed in 2017. And the Schomburg does include and is physically connected to the lovely original TAN 1904 library on the left, which was the original library on this site. So we will get back to that building in a few minutes. So we're gonna begin our celebration of women with the Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning writer, Toni Morrison. She was born in 1931 in Lorraine, Ohio. And Ms. Morrison died on August 5th, 2019 at age 88 in the Bronx. This is a bench by the road, which was placed in the courtyard of the Schomburg Library by the Toni Morrison Society in 2016. The Bench by the Road project was launched in February 2006 on the occasion of Toni Morrison's 75th birthday. The name is taken from Ms. Morrison's remarks in a 1989 interview with World Magazine, where she spoke of the absence of historical markers that help remember the lives of enslaved Africans. 
She said, there's no place you or I can go to think about or not think about to summon the presences of or recollect the absences of slaves. There's no suitable memorial or plaque or wreath or wall or park or skyscraper lobby. There's no 300 foot tower. There's no small bench by the road. The goal of the Bench by the Road project is to address the lament that Toni Morrison expressed in her interview by placing benches and plaques at sites commemorating significant moments, individuals, and locations within the history of the African diaspora. Since 2006, the Toni Morrison Society has placed 20 benches, including this one at the Schomburg Library at a variety of sites over a wide geographic area. So right outside the Schomburg Library, this block of West 136th Street was renamed Madam C.J. Walker and Alelia Walker Place in 2019. It serves as a reminder of the former presence and lasting importance of this mother and daughter. Madam C.J. Walker was born Sarah Breedlove in 1867 in the Louisiana Delta to parents who had been enslaved. Young Sarah was orphaned at age seven, married at age 14, and widowed by age 20. Despite these hardships, Madam Walker amazingly went on to become the nation's first black woman millionaire. She became wealthy by creating hair products and cosmetics for African-American women, establishing an Indianapolis factory in 1910. Madam C.J. Walker was proud to offer profitable employment to African-Americans who could work as commissioned sales agents, which was an important alternative to domestic employment. Madam Walker earned renown for both her business savvy and her philanthropy, through which she supported a wide variety of African-American educational and social institutions. So on the left is a famous photo of Madam C.J. Walker in her automobile in 1911. And on the right is a charming celebration of Madam C.J. Walker from the 125th Street subway station at Lenox Avenue. The artist is the famous Harlem-born Faith Ringgold a remarkable woman who is well worth celebrating in her own right. The title of the large mosaic from which this comes is Flying Home, Harlem Heroes and Heroines. One of the signature styles of Miss Ringgold's art is portraying people flying through the air. So here we see a wonderful image of Madam Walker flying over her company while her iconic automobile is driving by. Alelia Walker helped her mother found the C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company in 1905, and she opened its New York office and beauty salon in 1913. After Madam Walker's death in 1919, Alelia became the company's president. Madam Walker in 1913 hired the first licensed African-American architect in New York State, Vertner Tandy, to combine two townhouses on the west on West 136th Street. Alelia converted a floor of this home into a salon known as the Dark Tower, a gathering place for luminaries, including W.E.B. Du Bois and Langston Hughes. It was one of the most important salons of the Harlem Renaissance. Behind, besides entertaining Harlem and Greenwich Village writers, artists, and musicians, she entertained visitors from Africa and Europe. I am so sorry to say that this beautiful and historic building no longer exists. The home and salon that Madam Walker and Alelia Walker created was torn down for the construction of the new County Cullen branch of the New York Public Library in 1941. So on the left is a close-up of the 1904 building that we saw earlier that's now part of the Schomburg Library. This was originally the 135th Street Branch Library. It became too small 
And so in order to build the new library on the right in 1941, the Walker home was torn down. So a major reason that this happened is that there were no landmark laws for preservationists to use then to attempt to save treasured buildings like the Walker home and salon. In 2020, Netflix introduced in celebration of Women's History Month, a series entitled Self Made, inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker, starring Octavia Spencer as Madam Walker and Tiffany Haddish as her daughter, Alelia. There are four episodes and one of the creators is Madam Walker's great, great granddaughter, Alelia Bundles. So now we come to the Harlem Walk of Fame established in 1994 on West 135th Street. The photo on the first plaque says, honors persons whose visions, creativity and leadership have helped to create a better world. Currently there are 17 plaques of these four are women which I've highlighted in bold type. Two of the women are very familiar and the other two are not so well known. One thing I love about the Harlem Walk of Fame is that it gives us a chance to know some less famous women and their impressive accomplishments. I'm gonna start by talking briefly about Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday, focusing on each woman's relationship with New York City. Ella Fitzgerald was born in Newport News, Virginia in 1917, but raised in New York State starting in the early 1920s. She made her debut at age 17 on November 21st, 1934, in one of the earliest amateur nights at the Apollo Theater. Ella had intended to go on stage and dance, but she was so intimidated by a local dance duo named the Edward Sisters who performed ahead of her that Ella opted to sing instead. Ella Fitzgerald sang the songs Judy and the Object of My Affection and won first prize. She was quickly noticed and hired in 1935 by band leader Chick Webb. And the rest of course is history, but who knows what would have happened if Ella had danced that night instead of sung. Billie Holiday was born in Philadelphia in 1915, but moved to Harlem in 1929. Shortly after arriving, she began singing in nightclubs in Harlem at the tender age of 14. Unlike Ella Fitzgerald, who ended up making her home in California, Ms. Holiday stayed in New York City and continued to sing in the clubs here when she was not on the road. Sadly, Ms. Holiday lost her cabaret license in New York after being arrested for drug abuse in 1947. It is widely believed that she was targeted by the Bureau of Narcotics because of her activism, especially her singing of the song Strange Fruit about lynching. But Ms. Holiday was able to continue to perform for the last 12 years of her life at concert venues, including Carnegie Hall. In July 1959, she died in Manhattan at age 44. In 2019, Shirlane McRae, wife of Mayor Bill de Blasio, announced that New York City would commission an artist to create a statue honoring Ms. Holiday. It will be installed near Queens Borough Hall. In addition to Ella Fitzgerald's and Billie Holiday's plaques on the Walk of Fame, I am including here photos of parts of two murals where they seem to be honored. The one on the left is part of a large mural in the 116th Street, two, three subway stations named Minton's Playhouse Movers and Shakers. It honors many musicians and the artist says that the figures are composites. It's easy for me and perhaps you also to see this woman as a composite of Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday. She might look more like Ella, but she has Billie's trademark gardenia in her hair. 
The stunning mosaic on the right is above ground around the corner from the famous Apollo Theater. Entitled The Spirit of ha Harlem, it honors great musicians and dancers of the Harlem Renaissance. A New York Times article says that the woman singing is Ella Fitzgerald, but there are the Billie Holiday gardenias in her hair again. So perhaps this image is also a composite. So Lois Alexander was a fashion designer and founded the Harlem Institute of Fashion in 1966. This institute was formed to interest African-Americans in the garment industry and highlight their contributions to the trade. The Harlem Institute of Fashion gave free courses in dressmaking, millinery skills, and tailoring, as well as courses in English, mathematics, and African-American history. Ms. Alexander went on to found the Black Fashion Museum in 1979 originally established in Harlem on West 126th Street. The items in the collection range from clothing and bonnets worn by enslaved people in the mid 1800s to a dress sewn by Rosa Parks, who was a seamstress at the time of her famous arrest in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. It includes reproductions of ball gowns created by Elizabeth Keckley the once enslaved dressmaker to Mary Todd Lincoln. And there are gowns designed by the pioneering Anne Lowe, whose customers included Rockefellers, DuPonts, Vanderbilts, and most famously Jacqueline Kennedy, whose wedding dress she designed and sewed. The Black Fashion Museum relocated to Washington DC in 1994. Eventually the collection was donated by Ms. Alexander's daughter to what is now the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, which opened in 2016. The other lesser known woman on the Harlem Walk of Fame is Vivian Robinson. While working in the advertising department of the Amsterdam News, the local community newspaper of West Harlem, Ms. Robinson focused, noticed that many small theaters in Harlem were not being covered by the paper. So she volunteered to review their productions for the Amsterdam News. Then in 1973, she created Audelco, which stood for Audience Development Committee. The purpose was to generate recognition, understanding and awareness of the arts in black communities and to build new audiences for nonprofit theaters and dance companies. Under Ms. Robinson's direction, Odelco also sponsored a series of black theater festivals. The Odelco Awards Ceremony has become an annual event in the New York theater world with awards presented to playwrights, actors, directors, composers, designers, and theater companies. So our next stop is PS 92 at 222 West 134th Street, the Mary McLeod Bethune School serving pre-K through eighth grade. Also here is another street naming the first after a black woman in New York City. Ms. Bethune was an American educator, stateswoman, philanthropist, humanitarian, feminist and civil rights activist. She founded the National Council for Negro Women in 1935. Ms. Bethune was president or leader of a myriad of African-American women's organizations, including the National Association for Colored Women and the National Youth Administration's Negro Division. Ms. Bethune started a private school for African-American students in Daytona Beach, Florida, which later continued to develop as Bethune Cookman University. She was the sole black woman who was officially part of the UN, US delegation that created the United Nations Charter. For her lifetime of activism, Ms. Bethune was deemed the first lady of the struggle. Ms. Bethune is also honored in Faith Ringgold's subway mosaic, Flying Home, Harlem Heroes and Heroines. So this means of course that Ms. Bethune is also flying. 
Here she is with W.E.B. Du Bois, the founder of the NAACP, which he is flying over. And Ms. Bethune is flying over the National Council of Negro Women, which she founded. Sylvia Presley Woods was raised by her grandmother in South Carolina. She met her future husband, Herbert Woods, in a bean field when she was 11 years old and he was 12. He followed her when Sylvia moved to New York after high school and they married in 1944 when she was 18. They eventually had four children. Ms. Woods worked at a restaurant named Johnson's Luncheonette in Harlem from 1954 to 1962. When the owner wanted to sell in 1962, he offered the business to Ms. Woods for $20,000. And so it became the iconic Sylvia's on Malcolm X Boulevard between 126 and 127 streets. This is definitely the most famous restaurant in Harlem and the place to go for soul food. Over time, the business expanded and now seats up to 450 people. So this banner was put up after Ms. Woods died to honor her. She died in 2012, 50 years after she founded the restaurant. It's now owned and run by her children and grandchildren. So now we come to the iconic Apollo Theater on West 125th Street. It's a New York City landmark on both the outside and the inside. And Harlem's other walk of fame is located here. 25 artists are celebrated and there's plenty of room for more to be added. 10 of those celebrated in the Apollo Theater Walk of Fame are women. I've put nine of their plaques on the screen. We've already seen Ella Fitzgerald and Billie Holiday in the Harlem Walk of Fame. And we're going to meet one more of these women later on our walk. And this is the 10th plaque about a woman on the Apollo Theater Walk of Fame. And it shows how the theater honored Aretha Franklin after her death on August 16th, 2018. So these are the 10 women in the Apollo Theater Walk of Fame. Happily, four of them are alive today, Chaka Khan, Gladys Knight, Patti LaBelle, and Dionne Warwick. So the only one I'm gonna talk about now is the one woman on the list who is not a musician, and that is Jackie Moms Mabley. But if there are names here of women whom you would like to know more about, please ask me during the Q&A as I do have information about all of them. So Jackie Moms Mabley was born in North Carolina. She went on to establish a 60 year career as a top stand-up comedian in her time. Her stage persona became a woman in a loose dress and a floppy hat. Ms. Mabley started as one of the most successful entertainers on the African-American vaudeville circuit. Later, she starred in several films, became a headliner at the Apollo Theater, and in the 1960s had hit comedy albums. Mom Mabley was also a top draw for a number of TV variety shows, such as the Smothers Brothers, which introduced her to a whole new audience, the Baby Boomers. She became known as Moms because she was indeed a mom or mentor to many other comedians on the circuit in the 50s and 60s. Ms. Mabley came out as a lesbian at the age of 27, becoming one of the first openly gay comedians. She tackled topics too edgy for most mainstream comics of her time, including racism and homophobia. Now we come to the Harriet Tubman statue. I consider this stop to be the crown jewel of our tour. The title is Swing Low and the artist is Alison Saar, born in 1956, who's the daughter of another great artist, Betty Saar. The statue was commissioned by the Department of Cultural Affairs Percent for Art program and installed in 2008 
There's a lot going on here. And so we're gonna stay for several minutes. Born an enslaved person in 1822, Harriet Tubman managed against all odds to escape enslavement and help about 300 others escape. Of course, this was exceedingly difficult given that enslaved people could not read or write. They had no maps or compasses and there were men out on horses with dogs trying to catch fleeing enslaved people. Ms. Tubman is pictured here with her satchel as a conductor on the Underground Railroad. This of course was not an actual railroad, but a network of secret routes and safe houses for escaping to free Northern states and to Canada with the aid of abolitionists and sympathetic allies. In her skirt are many images which elaborate the story. There are accoutrements of enslavement, such as a chain and a lock. There are items you might use along the way as you're trying to escape, such as a bottle, a knife, and a pipe. There are faces of people whom she saved, and there is a shoe with a hole in it. At the bottom of the statue, there are scenes from Harriet Tubman's life from her birth seen here on the left to her death portrayed on the right. I'm gonna highlight a few of the panels in between. On the left, we see Harriet Tubman as a young enslaved woman. She's chopping wood at night. In the upper left is the North Star, which she is gazing up at thinking of escaping. One of the few ways that enslaved African-Americans who were on the run could navigate was by following the North Star. In the right panel before her attempt to escape, Ms. Tubman and the man she loves dance together under a starry sky, which even includes a comet. And here is Harriet Tubman getting married. Enslaved African-Americans, of course, were not allowed to marry legally. So they developed a ceremony called jumping over the broom, which we see here. In the right panel, Ms. Tubman is in fact fleeing with her pack on her back. And in the upper left corner, there is the North Star. Here we see Ms. Tubman leading others to safety. And on the right, we see the chains of enslavement being broken. Although the Underground Railroad is a metaphor, the idea of an actual railroad plays out quite literally in two ways in this work of art. One is that Ms. Tubman is depicted here as moving forward so fast that she is pulling up enslavement and oppression by the roots as she rushes to help her people. Harriet Tubman is actually rushing forward with the speed of a locomotive. And the reason we know this is that Ms. Sarr has actually turned her into a locomotive. So now we can see that the bottom of the front of Ms. Tubman's skirt has been made to resemble the grill, sometimes known as a cow catcher on the front of an old locomotive. The other reference to an actual railroad involves the placement of the statue. The grates on the left are part of the New York subway system. Often when one is visiting the statue, a train passes underground and the whole site rumbles. And what is the New York City subway system? It's an underground railroad. One final thing to say about Swing Low is that after its 2008 dedication, the statue generated controversy. Harriet Tubman is facing south instead of north toward freedom. A petition that garnered over a thousand signatures from members of the Harlem community in 2008 sought to have the statue reoriented so that Ms. Tubman would be rushing northward. But Alison Saar explained that it was her artistic vision to depict Harriet Tubman making the trip south to flee enslaved people still in bondage. So now we come to another renamed street corner. 
This street corner is dedicated to Ruby D and Ossie Davis as of April 2019. Ms. D was raised in Harlem, which is why I've selected a photo of her here as a young woman. She was an actor, poet, playwright, screenwriter, journalist, and civil rights activist. Her acting career spans 70 years and she appeared in nearly 60 films. Her husband, Ossie Davis, also a civil rights activist, had his own career spanning over 65 years and 50 films. They were married from 1948 until Mr. Davis's death in 2005. Now we come to another statue of another woman who helped a great many people, Clara McBride Hale, who became known as Mother Hale. This beautiful Harlem brownstone on West 122nd Street was her home, which later became known as Hale House. In the 1940s, Mother Hale opened a child daycare center in her home as a way to earn a living after she was widowed with three children. That led Mother Hale to become a foster mother who eventually took care of over 40 foster children from 1947 to 1968. In 1969, in her mid-60s, Mother Hale began to take in children of addicted mothers. This is the work that brought her to the attention of the public. Mother Hale eventually helped over a thousand drug addicted babies and young women. As if all that were not enough, she ultimately expanded her mission to include children born with HIV or whose parents died of AIDS. In 2008, Hale House closed. The building formerly occupied by Hale House is now privately owned. Fortunately, it's part of the beautiful Mount Morris Park Historic District in Harlem, which you can see a little bit more of on the right. So the exterior of the brownstone is protected by landmarking, but the statue is not protected and this is a preservation concern. On the way to our next destination, we're gonna pass by this condominium building on St. Nicholas Avenue between 118th and 119th. It was finished in 2003 and named after Rosa Parks. In addition to living in Alabama, Ms. Parks later lived in Detroit. She did not have a strong connection to New York City, but not surprisingly, the Harlem community has chosen to honor her. So we're gonna stop now to admire this mural of global women heroes at 116th Street and Frederick Douglass Boulevard. The women honored are Lema Gboi, a Liberian peace activist and Nobel laureate, Dolores Huerta, an American labor and civil rights activist, and one of the founders of the United Farm Workers Labor Union, Bree Newsom, an American civil rights activist who removed the Confederate flag from South Carolina's State House grounds in the aftermath of the Charleston shooting. Malawa Yousafzai, a Pakistani human rights activist, especially for women's and children's education, and also the youngest ever Nobel laureate. And Lena Kejrawal, an Indian photographer, installation artist, and activist on sex trafficking, and finally, Michelle Obama. The mural came about in a most interesting way. The sponsors facilitated a workshop in 2017 for young women detained in a New York City jail. These women conceived of a mural that celebrated the accomplishments of these six notable activist women of color. In the spring of 2018, a group of students from Maxine Green High School made the vision of the incarcerated women a reality by painting this mural. All four young artists agreed 
that working to realize the artistic vision of women in prison was a powerful experience. This is another street renaming and it took place in 2018 near a building where Zora Neale Hurston lived at one time. She was born in Alabama and raised in Florida. It has been pointed out that this woman of the Harlem Renaissance was also a Renaissance woman as she was both an anthropologist and the most prolific woman writer of the Harlem Renaissance. In her early career, Ms. Hurston conducted anthropological and ethnic research while she was a student at her alma mater of Barnard College and also at Columbia University. She had an interest in African-American and Caribbean folklore. Her literary anthology of African-American folklore in North Florida entitled Mules and Men was published in 1935. Also, Tell My Horse, Voodoo and Life in Haiti and Jamaica was published in 1938. Zora Neale Hurston also wrote more than 50 novels, short stories, plays, and essays concerned with both the African-American experience and her own struggles as an African-American woman. The most famous of her four novels is Their Eyes Were Watching God, published in 1937. But Miss Hurston's novels went relatively unrecognized by the literary world for decades. Interest was revived in March 1975 after the author Alice Walker published an article in Ms. Magazine entitled In Search of Zora Neale Hurston. And here is another delightful image from Faith Ringgold's mural. Ms. Hurston is flying with three other great African-American writers. County Cullen to her left, Langston Hughes above him, and James Baldwin above her. And they are flying over the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, where we stopped at the beginning of our walk. So now we're going to make one last stop in African American Harlem, and this is the Sojourner Truth School, named for this great. American abolitionist and woman's rights activist. Sojourner Truth was born into enslavement over only 65 miles north of New York City. She spent 30 years of her life as an enslaved woman from her birth in 1797 until New York State ended slavery on July 4th, 1827. Ms. Truth escaped with her infant daughter to freedom in 1826. After going to court to recover her son in 1828, she became the first black woman to win such a case against a white man. Ms. Truth subsequently became a famous orator against enslavement and for women's rights. Her best known speech was delivered extemporaneously in 1851 at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in Akron. The speech became widely known during the Civil War era by the title, Ain't I a Woman? It includes such lines as, I can carry as much as any man and eat as much too, if I can get it. I am as strong as any man now. During the Civil War, Ms. Truth helped recruit black troops for the, new, for the Union Army. So Sojourner Truth is a subject of not one, but two brand new statues within striking distance for those of us who live in the New York metro area. Neither is in Harlem, but as we transition now from central Harlem to East Harlem, we're going to leave Harlem briefly to take a look at them. They were both created to celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And they were both unveiled on August 26, 2020. So the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument by Meredith Bergman is right in the middle of Central Park in New York City on Literary Walk. 
Sojourner Truth is pictured speaking on the left. Susan B. Anthony is standing in the middle holding a pamphlet that reads Votes for Women, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton is seated on the right. I'm not gonna talk more about this statue as Friends of the Upper East Side actually sponsored a wonderful program on the statue in August, and the recording of that program is on their website. So the other statue has received much less publicity. This statue of Sojourner Truth is in the Hudson Valley. It's at the Welcome Center for the walkway over the Hudson. The walkway connects the towns of Highland and Poughkeepsie and is the longest elevated pedestrian bridge in the world. The statue is on the Highland side. So this stunning statue of Ms. Truth stands only eight miles from where she was born as an enslaved person in New York State in Ulster County in the town of Esopus. The statue is seven feet tall and weighs a thousand pounds. The artist pictured here is Vinnie Bagwell of Yonkers. So I'm so happy to say now that we're headed back into Manhattan, that the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs has commissioned Vinnie Bagwell to create this new public art to replace the removed statue of Dr. J. Marion Sims that stood at 103rd Street and Fifth Avenue. He was the 19th century gynecologist who experimented on enslaved black women to achieve his medical breakthrough. So this is Ms. Bagwell's proposed Victory Over Sims, a monumental 18 foot tall angel that will stand right across the street from East Harlem, which also makes this a perfect transition to our next stop, which is in East Harlem. So now we're in a area known also as Spanish Harlem and El Barrio, where murals and mosaics are an important part of the culture. We're gonna see how four remarkable women are celebrated. Our first stop is here at Lexington Avenue and 111th Street. This is Nicolasa Moore, a famed New Yorican writer born in 1938 who grew up in Spanish Harlem and the Bronx. The mural is up one story from the street, so it towers above us. It is painted, as you can tell, to look in places like a mosaic made of tiny pieces of glass or tile. This high location should help to preserve the mural as it is unlikely up there to be a target of graffiti. New Yorican is a mashup of the terms New York and Puerto Rican and refers to the culture of the Puerto Rican diaspora located in and around New York City. In 1973, Ms. Moore became the first Latinx woman in modern times to have her literary works published by major commercial publishing houses. She developed the longest career as a creative writer for these publishing houses of any Latinx female writer. Her works such as the book Nilda in Her Hand tell of growing up in the Puerto Rican communities of the Bronx and East Harlem and the difficulties Puerto Rican women face in the United States. So now we're looking at two murals of Celia Cruz, who is also commemorated in the Apollo Theater Walk of Fame. The mural on the right, like the Nicolosa Moore mural, is on 111th Street. It's by Eliezer Lycia, painted in 2019. James de la Vega painted the mural on the left, honoring this Cuban-American singer, and it's on 103rd Street. Ms. Cruz died in 2003, the year the mural was painted. As you can see, after 17 years, it's not in great condition, so it's wonderful to have the newer mural also. 
The most popular Latin artist of the 20th century, Celia Cruz earned 23 gold albums and was a recipient of the National Medal of Arts. She spent her career working in the United States and several Latin American countries. Billboard magazine once said Ms. Cruz is indisputably the best known and most influential female figure in the history of Cuban and Latin music. She was renowned internationally as the queen of salsa as well as the queen of Latin music. This beautiful mosaic of Julia de Burgos with many wonderful details is by Manny Vega. The mural was unveiled in 2006 as a tribute to this Puerto Rican writer who was an advocate of Puerto Rican independence, a civil rights activist, and a literary foremother of the New Yorican movement. Ms. de Burgos lived with depression and alcoholism in the latter part of her short life of 39 years. On July 6, 1953, she collapsed on a sidewalk in Spanish Harlem and later died of pneumonia at a hospital in Harlem. Since she was carrying no ID and no one claimed her body, the city of New York gave her a pauper's burial. Eventually, some of Miss de Burgos's friends and relatives were able to find her grave and claim her body. A committee was organized to have her remains transferred to Puerto Rico, where she was given a hero's funeral and burial and a monument in the city of Carolina. So this beautiful building across the street from the mosaic is the Julia de Burgos Latino Cultural Center. It was public school 72 from 1886 till it closed in 1975. It's one of the oldest intact public school buildings in New York City and an NYC landmark. Now its mission is to foster Latino arts, cultural awareness and appreciation through celebration and education. So Julia de Burgos is obviously greatly loved in this community. There's a mosaic in her honor, a large cultural center named after her, and this street sign where she gets not just a street corner, but a whole boulevard. Now our last stop to see how accomplished women are celebrated in East Harlem is a mural dedicated to Julia de Burgos and the iconic Mexican painter Frida Kahlo. This is Soldaderas by Yasmin Hernandez, painted in 2011. It's on Lexington Avenue between 104th and 105th. This gem of a mural is actually a hidden gem as it's on the back wall of the Modesto Flores Community Garden, which is almost always locked. Soldaderas were military women who participated in the Mexican Revolution from 1910 through 20. In addition to honoring these two women, this mural honors the common history and struggle of two peoples, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. Julia de Burgos, whose dates were 1907 to 1954, and Frida Kahlo, whose dates were 1914 to 1953 lived around the same time. It's not known though whether their paths actually ever crossed. So the inspiration for this mural is the two Frida's painting by Ms. Kahlo from 1939. Ms. Kahlo was the daughter of a father of European background and a mother of indigenous background. So here we see her in her white Victorian Western style dress on the left and her indigenous clothing on the right. The two Fridas are holding hands and their hearts are connected by a common blood vessel. In the Soldaderas mural, Frida, a Mexican and Julia, a Puerto Rican also sit together clasping hands in solidarity. Their hearts are also connected by a common blood vessel. In addition, each has bands of bullets crisscrossed on her chest. The women are thus portrayed as both soul sisters and soldier sisters. 
Behind them, the Mexican and Puerto Rican flags share the central red stripe. These women are portrayed as contemporaries who though hailing from different countries are battling the same challenges at a time in which their male counterparts did not delve into personal issues in their writing and art, both de Bergos and Kahlo unapologetically made the personal political. Both shared a profound love of their respective homelands, appreciated and upheld revolutionary ideals and embodied a feminist outlook. So I don't want to leave the impression that every woman celebrated in a work of art in Harlem is famous. There are also many representations which celebrate all the women who live in these Harlem neighborhoods. So I'm going to end with a couple of those. Here is both a mosaic on the left and a mural on the right from East Harlem that represent the women of the community. The mosaic on the left is in the 110th Street Lexington Avenue subway station. It's another artwork like the mosaic of Julia de Burgos by the brilliant artist Manny Vega. The mural on the right is on East 100th Street. This is by an artist who goes by Lunar New Year. So please note the crescent moon, which is most likely the artist's metaphoric signature. Inside the crescent moon is the highway symbol that warns drivers that there may be people in the area who are fleeing. So this is a migration reference, especially migration of undocumented people. Lunar New Year says that the image is of a Bronx woman named Libertad. According to him, the simplest metaphor is that there is a rebirth of the future of the US represented by the new Freedom Tower pictured here. But he says the mural is also about the resurgence of his generation. Note that in fact, Libertad is pushing her baby into the light and the darkness is behind her. For a mural of a woman we might meet in the central Harlem community where we started, we're gonna cycle back to the vibrant mural on the title page. This is by Creative Art for Public Art Youth Employment Program. The write-up about, write about it says, all of the young people working on this site are from the immediate neighborhood. The subject of the mural reflects their youthful and optimistic view of life in Harlem. This smiling young woman listening to music dreams of a bright future for herself and her community as icons representing family, technology, music and the arts swirl around her head. So what a perfect upbeat statement about the young women of the 21st century with which to end our feminist walk through Harlem. So thank you so much for attending this virtual walk. I appreciate so much the opportunity to show these sites and tell the stories of these remarkable women. And before uh, Valerie and Franny uh, join me on the video screen, I just have a very brief epilogue of four slides to show what happened to one of the beautiful works of art that we have just seen. Because we are, after all, sponsored tonight by preservation organizations. So um, this is a preservation tale. So this is the mosaic entitled The Spirit of Harlem, part of which we saw earlier. It was commissioned in 2005 for the people of Harlem by the North Fork Bank. The mural is on the side of the retail space formerly occupied by the bank. In 1915, another business, Foot Action, moved into that space. Foot Action decided to cover up this stunning mural with the black brick wall that we can see in this slide. So the mural is actually under those bricks. Over time, there were protests from the Harlem community and threats to boycott the store. Foot Action did respond and agree to restore the mural. So the slide of it that I showed 
just now is the restored version. And these are both the original plaque from 2005 and the plaque from 2018, which really tell the story of this mural. And I do also want to uh, pay homage to Louis Del Sarte, the, auth the um, artist who designed the mural as he just died in May of 2020. So now I am going to stop screen sharing. And um, I'd love to hear from Valerie Bradley uh, more about the story of this mosaic and also how the mosaic managed to survive being under that brick wall. So thank you very much again. Valerie, just one second, you're muted. Um, and while you mute yourself, let me check. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, can I just uh, intervene just for a brief second? Thank you, Lee. Um, okay. Everyone, again, if you'd like to submit a question, please do so via the chat. And also, if you'd like to turn on your video for us to have this conversation, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and on that, Valerie, sorry for interrupting. Okay, thank you so much, Lee. It was a wonderful Welcome. presentation. And uh, it's uh, quite fitting that we would end with uh, the Louis Del Start uh, mural, which was covered up in 2015, not 1950. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it just, just shows the temerity and the what would you call it? Um, the, uh, I guess, ignorance of uh, newcomers to the community who think that they can come in and destroy our heritage and that it's all right. But our community said it wasn't all right. And, uh, but we face these kinds of abuses day in and day out, which is why Harlem, Safe Harlem Now was founded to deal with that. Uh, you might know that uh, only about 3.7% um, of Harlem's neighborhoods and land uh, and buildings are landmark, while 75% of the buildings and uh, uh, neighborhoods in the uh, Greenwich Village are landmark, and about 50% are landmarked in on the Upper West Side and the Upper East Side. Let me know if I'm wrong, Franny, on that. Uh, so we're trying to catch up and it's, it, it's difficult because developers are moving very swiftly uh, to uh, knock down our buildings, take over our churches and knock them down. We're losing them daily as we speak. Uh, and this is all a part of our very important history uh, that will make Harlem not be Harlem anymore. It's, uh, you know, it's been known for its low to mid-size uh, development. And now we're getting these, uh, we're having issues with uh, buildings that are very tall and have no context with what is already built. Uh, so it's with great joy that we got that the um, the Louis Del Sart mural was restored. Uh, I saw him in 2018 during the Mount Morris Park Community Improvement Association uh, uh, house tour, and he was featured in the house tour because he had a book that had come out and he was signing his book during the house tour and the house tour was about salons. So I was, my house was in uh, the house tour for a salon, but I had tap dancers and jazz, uh, uh, a jazz combo and a fortune teller and whatever. So Lewis was in a house across the street from me. He comes over to my house and they never could get him out of my house. So they had to bring his books over to my house for him to sign. And it's so sad that we lost him in May, but he was an incredible artist. And I'm so happy that his mural has been restored. Great. 
Amen. Um, Lee, um, one small question. So we noticed that out of the women that you mentioned on the Apollo Theater Walk of them, four of them are still alive. Could you talk a little bit more about them? Or are they still active? Um, let me see what I have. I'm not necessarily um, sure. Of well, the she had Shaka Khan, and Shaka Khan is still very active. One of my favorite singers. Uh, she's still kicking butt, singing, <laughs> uh, moving around. She's in her late 60s now. And then there was Patti LaBelle, who's uh, about 75 or 76 years old, and who is still singing, and who was recently in a virtual competition with Gladys Knight, who is also in that mural, uh, I mean, on that walk of fame. And Gladys Knight is also about 75 or 76 years old. And both of them are still recording, still singing, very vibrant and uh, out there. And uh, even young people know of them. Yeah. And then the fourth one was Dionne Warwick. Dionne Warwick is still alive and also sings often with Patti LaBelle and with uh, Gladys Knight. And they've been featured in television uh, specials, uh, singing songs. And these were the women who were the singers during my teen years uh, in the 1960s. So, you know, like they're near and dear to my heart. And uh, certainly I think people of my generation, you know, the baby boomers, uh, remember these women and are so pleased that they are still with us and still very active and doing their thing. Great. Um, a follow-up question, Valerie, on that thing uh, that you mentioned that they were in a Zoom thing. Do you know if it was recorded? I believe it is. You could probably go to uh, you, uh, YouTube and uh it was a couple it was a couple of months ago everybody on facebook was whoa wow did you see patty and and gladys they wore it out it was like you know it was it was like kind of like a competition kind of thing but not really because these two women have been friends for decades so you can go to youtube right um, Valerie, and now this is a question for you. Uh, we are, um, is there any specific um, location on Harlem now that you're actively fighting with LPC to have it designated that you wanted to get the word out uh, where we can? Okay, well, we're not fighting. We're very proud that LPC is now studying a new area for a designation and it's the Doris Brooke Square area that they're now studying. And uh, it's a, a unique, unique area and if designated will be the first historic district named for an African-American. And we're pleased about that. Two years ago, uh, a neighborhood between 130th to 132nd Street was designated and this particular neighborhood featured uh, the building where the 1963 March on Washington was planned. And we did a virtual salon in conjunction with um, Harlem One Stop and uh, the 100th anniversary of uh, the Harlem Renaissance. You can find this on our uh, Facebook page uh, which is uh, safeharlemnow.org, uh, or well, Safe Harlem Now. And then it's not on our website because it's too big of a piece, but it includes uh, a rare film that was uh, done about the march. So, you know, most people know of the march because of Martin Luther King's speech, but they didn't, they've never really seen what people were doing on that day in 1963 or the months leading up to the 1963 March on Washington and the United States Information Service, which is our, our propaganda uh, arm here in this country, which is not allowed to show uh, 
it's propaganda in this country, but after a certain number of decades, it's been released. And so we have a, about 20 minutes of that film in the virtual salon. And then we feature a um, panel of people who were actually involved in planning the march who are still around. They were very young. Rochelle Harowitz uh, and uh, Dr. Um, let's see, I'm sorry, um, Joyce Ladner, uh, Cortland Cox, and uh, Linelda Kendi uh, were uh, our panelists, and it was uh, who, uh, it was moderated by uh, activist and consultant Chet White. So it's quite interesting to see it uh, and to hear their perspectives on what went into planning that march. I might add that in that historic district, there are many, many historic areas, but also the uh, uh, Amsterdam, New Amsterdam Musical Association building is in that historic district. And that was the first labor union for musicians that was formed in response to the fact that uh, white labor unions would not uh, allow them membership, yet you had to have a union card in order to play at um, clubs and at uh, various musical venues. So they bought a building, uh, they actually organized in 1908 and they purchased this particular building in 1922. Uh, and is still very active. Great. Um, before I go to the next question, someone was very kind to throw in the chat the link for the Patty LaBelle and Gladys Knight um, <laughs> saying off. So I'm going to share with everyone because I know what I'm going to be watching after this is over. So if everyone wants to do this, uh, the link is in the chat too. Um, and another question, uh, it might be either for Lee or for um, Valerie. We talked a lot about singers and women and the importance of, of music in African American culture. And so what is the difference between then and now? Like, are there more recording studios now than there were before? How, how, how has this changed through time? Well, I don't know about recording studios. I don't think hardly any of them have been African-American except for Motown and uh, the one that was in Memphis. And they are no longer uh, African-American controlled. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there are many women who are singing, but they're primarily recorded in um, studios or through companies that are uh, owned and dominated by uh, the majority group. Uh, one of the big problems with having African-American record companies, I think some of the rap stores uh, and underground rap have their own recording studios. And of course there are some women who are affiliate with, affiliated with them. I think Queen Latifah was one who got her start that way. Uh, and of course you do have uh, other very popular singers, but n to my knowledge, there are very few African-American owned recording studios. So maybe that's the difference. Uh, there weren't many before, there certainly aren't that many now. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, everyone. I I think I got to all the questions that we got through the chat. If anyone has any more, uh, I, I just got a, another message. I've been getting a lot of messages in the chat, all of them thanking both Valerie and Lee. Um, but I'll, I'll wait a few a few more minutes to see if we have um any more questions and i will um 
again, thank both of you for joining us. And I did send the um, Save Harlem Now Facebook on the chat as well. Also Lee's uh, contact information. But if anyone has any follow-up uh, questions that haven't been answer just send us an email and if you have any uh anything else just send us an email and thank I you might, i might add though um I'm, I'm happy that lee pointed out that uh the uh madam cj walker building was raised to build the county cullen branch library not the schomburg the schomburg is a research library and it was built uh, and connects with the original library. Uh, and then the County Cullen, which is next door to it, was a branch library, library that was built, but the Schomburg did not replace the Walker building. I mean, the Walker's uh, residence. All right, well, thank you for that. And with that, I thank you everyone um and we'll see you next time okay well thank you very much it was a great pleasure to participate in this program so i really appreciated the thank you all appreciate the positive feedback that's apparently come into the chat so thank you thank you all enjoy your evenings <laughs> <laughs>